we are already alarmed with changes happening. Let's hear from our experts today. On behalf of ADA team, I wish safe times ahead. Have a great day. Over to you, Amar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be hosting this webinar, guys. This is Amar here. Uh, I am from Daily Dump. We are a 14-year-old waste management organization from Bangalore, and we've been working on changing mindsets around waste and sustainability for quite some time now. And I hope this webinar uh, allows some of you to change your mindsets uh, a, a little bit and also shed some light on the current situation of COVID and uh, health in the times of COVID. Uh, just for the first 30 to 40 seconds of the webinar, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to uh, open a screen now, which will have a QR code and a website mentioned. And what I would... I hope everybody can see my uh, 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 screen as I'm sharing it. And so there is a, a QR code on your screens right now, uh, guys. Uh, so if, if uh, just uh, for people who use iPhones or Android phones, you can go to your camera and scan this QR code. Uh, uh, it will show up a pop-up on the top uh, uh, with the website link. And you can click on that and go to this website called menti.com. Or you can directly go to menti.com on your browser and you can type in this code. So either you can do the QR code or you can do, do this code on menti.com website. It will, lead to you, uh, uh, it will lead you to a question uh, which will have three options. So if you can just choose one of those options and press submit to start the webinar. It's just one question uh, that we're doing to set the tone for the webinar. Uh, maybe for the next uh, uh, 30 to 40 seconds, we'll try to get as many uh, entries as possible into the question. I repeat again, you can just go to your camera app and scan this QR code, or you can go to menti.com on your browser and just type in the code when it opens that. This code is also scannable on the Paytm app, guys. Hello, how do I scan? Uh, you, can, uh, you can go to your camera uh, app, ma'am, and you can uh, just put the camera to this uh, QR code that I'll just put on the screen right now. And it will it will show it will open up a website on the top it will show a link to the browser you can go there or if you don't want to scan you can go to menti.com this website mentioned and just type in this code it will ask for a code and quickly you can just uh, uh, answer the question mentioned there uh, we'll just give this another 15 seconds guys Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, sir, I have given that uh, QR code in uh, menti.com and after that it says, uh, thanks, for, thanks for the participation. Is that all or uh, should we have to do anything else more? That should be fine. That means you've uh, answered the uh, question mentioned there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, so I, I think uh, uh, we, we'll just stop here. Uh, we'll take in all the uh, answers that have uh, come in. And I'll just present it on the screen uh, here. So, so this was the question that we just asked. How are you feeling right now? And uh, one of us is actually feeling really low and anxious. I'm, uh, I hope whoever you are, this web, uh, webinar helps you to kind of gain more confidence and uh, be more positive uh, in the current times. 39 of us are feeling really good, which is a great sign. Actually, the last time we did this uh, uh, poll, there were lesser people feeling good. Uh, but this is great to know. And 21 of us are feeling okay, but uncertain. 
And the reason we do this uh, a poll right now is just to see uh, what are we feeling, especially in these times of COVID and lockdown when everybody's in their homes. Uh, feelings of uncertainty and uh, uh, anxiousness are pretty common. And, and even right now, as you can see, more than 30 to 40 percent of us who've joined in are feeling slightly towards the uncertain side. And this is just for us to gauge the, uh, the audience and see, okay, uh, 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 how are people feeling when they've joined this webinar? And uh, just to see if this helps them uh, uh, gain more clarity around them and helps to answer their, their, their questions. Uh, now I'll quickly move on. Uh, uh, we are very lucky to have today two uh, uh, esteemed experts amongst us. We have uh, Dr. Ramkrishna Gaud, who is the professor and head uh, Department of Community Health in St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. And we have with us Dr. Arvind Kasturi, who is a professor in the Department of Community Health at St. John's as well. And we actually uh, uh, invited lots of questions from participants and we were enthralled that many of you have uh, sent in so many questions to the doctors already, which we actually collated and gave to the doctors. Uh, we will now, I will now move it on, on to the doctors to speak and shed some light on the questions that you've already asked. And they would also cover some of their experts and expertise on health uh, uh, during the times of COVID. Uh, so I'll just request now uh, Dr. Arvind, uh, if, if you're there, if you can just uh, uh, speak uh, uh, to the audience and, uh, and, and throw some light on things. Sir. Yeah, well, good morning, uh, everybody. And uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be with you this morning on this very interesting webinar with, I understand, a lot of members from the apartment community. Very, very important because apartments uh, represent for us mini communities in themselves. And therefore, uh, whatever we can convey yeah. today in the form of this webinar, I certainly do hope that it makes a difference to all of you. So from my colleague, Dr. Gaud, who's on this webinar, and myself, Arvind Kasturi, uh, we bring you greetings from our institution, St. John's Medical College. Uh, we both of us work in the Department of Community Health. So now let me try to put my tech skills into practice and share screen. Let me see if I can actually do that. Yeah, okay, so this is the screen that I wish to share. Um, I trust all of you can see the screen that I am sharing with you now. Uh, we we are basically speaking about health and wellness in the time of COVID-19. I thought that I would start a bit with what most of us probably know, but just to give a background to whatever we are going to speak about the virus itself, about its consequences, and those wonderful questions which all before us. So very quickly, the story so far christened the novel coronavirus 2019 or COVID-19, as it is called in short. Novel simply because we haven't had this brand of coronavirus discovered before this. So that's why it's called novel or new. It's a highly infective uh, virus. It spreads through respiratory droplets. And I, I think all of us can think at this point of the common cold or even the phenomenon of red eye that we get around spring, early summer, which is conjunctivitis. And how if one member of the family gets it, generally other people get it as well. So this is also a virus like that. It's highly infective, spreads from one person to another through respiratory droplets, which are generated when we cough, when we sneeze, and to a very small extent when we speak as well. Now, generally, this infection causes a mild illness. Dr. Arvind, no Dr. Arvind at all. just one minute. Uh, Dr. Arvind, just sorry to interrupt you. The, your audio is not clear. Audio uh, is not are, you, clear. are you using a, a, a earphones? Well, I'm not at the moment. Shall yeah. I try to start we, doing that? Could we try if that, you, please? If, yeah, if you use the headphones, it might be better. Yeah, then we won't get this okay. echo. Sorry, doctor. Um, is this better? Yes, Hello? we can. Yes, yes, yes we can. Better, yes, yes, better, yes, better. Much better. Sure. Much better. So, thank, uh, thank you very much for that. Now you are looking like so, a pilot, sir. 
<laughs> this is a tricky aircraft to, to pilot. <laughs> anyway, so as I was saying, it's a, it's a highly infective virus, uh, spreads through respiratory droplets. I asked all of you to imagine the common cold and conjunctivitis, two simple conditions which are fairly kind of interesting question. And however, if one member of the family gets it, generally other people get it as well. So mostly the coronavirus infection is a mild illness. With, now the ICMR tells us that there are almost no symptoms at all or very mild illness, which is just a fever, a cough. Uh, sorry, doctor. Yes, doctor, yes. Uh, doctor? Yes. Uh, Again, there is, is there a loose connection? Is there a, no, when you're speaking, it's going up and down, up and down. So is, is there it? a loose connection or? Uh, uh, is this better? I kind of tweaked it a bit. Is it better? Yeah, and I, I think you should, yeah, yeah. Is okay, that better? Now, now it's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I was saying that it causes a mild illness in most of us. 80 to 85% of the people whom it infects, it's a very, very mild infection. It's only in 10% of people. And uh, there, perhaps the elderly and those with chronic disease like high blood pressure, diabetes, these are people who we call at higher risk. And it is only in those people that this infection causes more severe symptoms. And that could be difficulty in breathing and the syndrome that we call pneumonia, which is a severe respiratory infection. And the other term that all of you might have encountered is severe acute respiratory illness or SARI, uh, called SARI. Or SARI is the, the syndrome of severe acute respiratory illness of this is caused in a very small percentage of people with coronavirus infection. Now, as of yesterday, our figures are these. In India, we have tested almost 8.3 lakh people, of whom 33,600 and odd were positive, plus or minus a few, depending on which source you look at. That's about 4% of whom we tested have shown up as positive. And in Karnataka state, it's even less. We've tested about 55,000 people of whom about 1% are positive. Now in Delhi, Bombay and other cities like that, these percentages are a little higher. Uh, almost 8 to 9% of people in Bombay have tested positive. But remember, this is among those whom we tested. Now, the mortality figures are about 3 to 4% in India. That is, we had up to yesterday, 1,094 deaths out of 33,000 people whom we tested positive. But this percentage is a little um, uh, not uh, very it, accurate. Uh, it might be smaller than this because we need to divide the number of deaths by the complete number of people who are infected, which means that we really don't know that number. So it's likely to be less than that. So in short, what are we talking about? We're talking about coronavirus infection in this like the common cold with most people ranging from Dr. Arvind. Dr. Arvind, you are uh, breaking up a little again. Again, okay. I'm so sorry for this connection. It's a connectivity issue, I think. Uh, is this better, Amar? It's it's get it's clearer now, yes. I'm so sorry. Well, okay. this is an illness, like we said, like the common cold with most people, ranging from no symptoms to mild symptoms. Transmitted also very similar to the combo just sneezing and respiratory problems. It can cause severe illness death in a very small percentage of people. And that is where it is unlike the common cold. So this is what we are talking about. This is the infection that we are talking about so far, the COVID-19 infection. Now, what do we what do we see as our way forward as the lockdown lifts, if not in the next few days, at least in the next couple of weeks. What are we aiming at? We are aiming at trying to keep ourselves and everybody who comes into contact with us in our apartment blocks uninfected. And that includes measuring our waste well. And I think that's an important facet of this webinar. As a second strategy, we must remember that there are many people who have health problems apart from COVID. Just because of our focus on coronavirus infection, 
I think we shouldn't forget those. We must ensure the care of those who have what we call non-COVID conditions. And as a third strategy, we must ensure that everybody knows exactly what to do if you get symptoms of COVID-like illness. Now, at this point, what I'm going to do is focus on one aspect of our first strategy of keeping everybody uninfected. An important part of that is to manage our waste well. So at this point, I'm going to call upon my colleague, Dr. Ramakrishna Daud, uh, head of the Department of Community Health at St. John. He has worked extensively in the area of waste management. And Dr. Gaur, I think you are privy to many of the questions which our community of apartment owners and dwellers have asked. And I'm requesting Dr. Gaur to take us through some of the principles of waste management in this time, based on the questions that you have asked over the next 10 or 12 minutes. Dr. Gaur, okay. over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arvind and uh, Poonamji and uh, the team of uh, Daily Dump and the organizers of this uh, webinar. Thanks a lot for uh, having me and Dr. Arvind here and giving us an opportunity uh, to do what we love the most, that is to be with the people out there in the open. Uh, so reaching out into them in uh, many various ways, uh, you know, that is possible. So thanks a lot, uh, Poonamji and Amar and uh, all of your team at uh, Adda as well as Daily Dump for making this happen. So, uh, right. So myself, Dr. Ramakrishna Gaud, uh, Dr. Arvind uh, said I am an expert. Yeah, I know a few aspects of uh, the, the waste and very pertinently biomedical waste. But anyway, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, you know, uh, make this journey for the next uh, 10 or 11 minutes that uh, are allotted to me. Now, uh, we all know this. We live, when we live, we generate waste. And wherever we live, we generate waste. Even if we go to the forest and we live, start living there, we generate waste. On the Himalayas, if we go on expedition, we generate waste. On the high seas, we travel, we generate waste. We go to North Pole, South Pole, we generate waste. Wherever a human being goes, waste gets generated. While that happens, uh, it is incumbent on the generator. So the generator is a key here. It is incumbent on the generator to be responsible for the waste that uh, they generate. And manage accordingly there are ideal ways and they are feasible ways and they are irresponsible ways of uh, managing waste for us to manage waste irresponsibility irresponsibly uh, irresponsible waste man uh, management of waste also is management okay so uh, so we have to do that so uh, there are no perfect solution for waste that the human beings generate uh, Anywhere in the world, we, there is no place in the world where it can boast that nah, we have the paka and the, you know, the absolutely foolproof, uh, you know, methods of waste management. But what certainly is possible with the knowledge and the experience that we have is what are the ways that we are generating even at this point of time on the 1st of May 2020, we have within us both uh, the technology and the operational details to see that the ways that we generate uh, is made relatively less harmful to the fellow human beings uh, and to all the wealth the nature has endowed us as well. So, uh, so what do I mean by this? Let's take the example of the communities we live in. Here, uh, being uh, the apartments or a, a a a geographic area which has certain number of you know the dwellers in the households. Now, what are the ways that we generate uh, in in uh, in the in our communities? You all know that, but just uh, to uh, take us through A to Z, uh, let me do this quickly. So, the ways that we generate uh, at our communities, at our households, are the waste such uh, can, it can be categorized into two: what the corporations and many other experts in the field term as uh, wet and dry waste. But I would prefer the terms biodegradable waste and non-biodegradable waste. Now, the biodegradable waste forms the chunk of the waste that we generate. What do we mean by biodegradable waste? Or uh, most of uh, us can relate to it as wet waste. What do we mean? Uh, you know, uh, what is the quantum of this biodegradable waste? And what consists of, uh, what constitutes this biodegradable waste? It is the waste that we generate in our kitchens, the food waste, 
the vegetable waste uh, the leftover uh, food materials the sambars the idlis the dosas the uh, the the stale food the leftover food improperly uh, stored all these things constitute uh, biodegradable waste and this biodegradable waste constitutes about 60 to 70% of the total waste that we generate uh, at a macro level and even at a household level uh, it constitutes about uh, close to 50 to 60% now how do we manage it the way for managing this compost is uh, daily dump and uh, similar such organizations have this expertise you can we can compost this waste at the point of generation that is at the household level or if it is an apartment apartment block of 25 houses all of these apartment blocks can come together segregate this waste and collect this waste separately and they can look at uh, the available options for composting this waste within their premises it can be on the terraces or it can be on any other open space that uh, may be available uh, in that apartment block it is up to the communities to look at you know what is feasible so the point i'm trying to make here is we have today the resources to manage the waste that we generate uh, within our households uh, one good example being the technology and the you know the details that we have from the daily dump we also have within us the ability to generate uh, manage this waste at a, a larger uh, you know more than couple of household level and uh, we were a, a party to the discussion with uh, uh, the bangalore municipal corporation they were thinking of managing this uh, biodegradable waste at a ward level and uh, it is also possible to do this at a zonal level bangalore has bangalore is north south and bangalore urban these are the zones so but for this to happen segregation is a key and uh, a segregation needs a mindset it needs an attitude and it uh, requires a willingness to do this segregation at the point of generation is a key uh, is a, it is the heart it is the soul and it is a mind of any waste management system that uh, we think of if we don't segregate uh, no technology shall uh, uh, would work so segregation is a key so thus far i have been speaking about biodegradable waste so on the other side we have non biodegradable waste non biodegradable waste um, we have in terms of the papers the polythene covers that we get into our households on a daily basis the milk packets which all of us can relate to then we have the burnt uh, tube lights and the cfl tubes and uh, you know materials such as these then we have the spoiled keyboards and the uh, you know uh, discs and electronic waste so to speak and we also have the torn chapels and other things all these things constitute non biodegradable waste now uh, while by segregation of biodegradable waste is simple and straightforward segregation of non biodegradable waste is a one which poses a lot of questions on the minds of the people and if you start about uh, segregating you know you have to segregate uh, you know the waste uh, electronic waste separately then you have to segregate the hazardous waste such as the burnt batteries uh, you know separately then you have to segregate your newspaper separately because it can go in for recycling then you have to segregate plastic separately so people immediately think of oh my god i have to have is it required for me to have so many uh, waste containers you know that's a question well there's a simple it, it would come to anybody's mind but but if you take a deep breath and if you put a thought to it especially in the communities especially in the apartments it may be difficult at a household level i dare say that but it is relatively easy to do this at a larger community level at an apartment block level so if the community members come together and if they decide hey guys while by there's no question of biodegradable waste not being uh segregated it has to go though there are technologies uh, wherein people come and promote technologies no you don't have to segregate waste everything can go into one container and we take that waste and we will uh, do the further processing uh, while that may be possible but that is not the efficient and the environment friendly way to do it so first and foremost for any waste management system that we think of even in the covid 19 kind of an environment we have to be segregating biodegradable waste completely it should be completely separated out from the rest of the waste that is non negotiable coming back to the non biodegradable waste which has just started so it is it is up to the communities to take a decision if you ask me i will give you a list of 10 or 12 segregations that you should make 
which I, it will be great if you can make all that. But let the communities come together, make a collective decision. Hey guys, at this point of time, uh, no, we cannot go in for this many segregations. But yes, to begin with in the first month, let's see that every paper that we uh, generate, dry paper that we generate in the form of a newspaper or any other such paper, we will ensure that the papers and the plastics in our residential complex shall be separated. At least let's do that in the first two months. Then later on, with, while if we do that, 100% automatically it so happens that your mechanism, the operations that you have put in waste, the people will start asking questions. Hey, while we are doing this, why this waste is getting mixed up? Can we also segregate this waste? So automatically it will uh, lead to segregation of other streams of waste. But the key for this is we have to ensure that the decided upon waste items, non biodegradable waste items must be segregated. We can call it newspapers, we can call it plastics, you can call it electronic waste. Decide upon what you want to segregate. Ensure that segregation happens. And set small goals. Go about it. And as you go on, many other streams automatically, you know, uh, the people themselves will come and say, no, we'll have to do this as well. So it will happen. So make that happen. Amidst this, there is also biomedical waste, which my colleague Dr. Arvind rightly mentioned. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, people in our apartment uh, complex who generate biomedical waste. There may be patients who are taking insulin shots. There may be some patients who are going on for dialysis. And there may be patients who are taking medications and the blister packs. And, uh, you know, there may be children generating, uh, uh, you know, the, the empty uh, or partially used uh, syrup bottles, both glass and plastic. We also have biomedical waste that the household generate in our communities. So with regards to the biomedical waste, there is an ideal way of doing it and there is a practical and feasible way of doing it. And uh, like I mentioned in the, uh, like I mentioned in the solid waste, uh, like I mentioned in the solid waste, segregation of non-biodegradable waste is non-negotiable. It should happen. Likewise, for the biomedical waste that we generate in our uh, residential complexes, there are few things that are non-negotiable. That non-negotiable bits are the broken glass pieces, the syringe uh, and needles, should be separated. They must be separated. Rest of the biomedical waste, even if we contain it separately together, that's fine. But the broken ampules, the needle embedded syringes, needles must be separated. There is no question of they getting mixed with any other waste. Right? So please ensure this happens. We can take, I'll take questions at the, at the later part, how we can do it. But please, at this point of time, tell yourself that the needle embedded syringes, uh, what I mean by that is insulin syringes, the needles that we generate, a family physician may have come to your residential complex and given an injection to an elderly person or other person, you know, suffering from pain or other thing or an antibiotic may have been given. So that needle embedded syringes, needles, uh, broken glass must be separated from the rest of the biomedical waste. And I'll just make one more point and then I'll uh, pass it on. The other ways that we generate in our communities is the sanitary napkins the diapers that we use for the children, the babies, and also we have some senior citizens with incontinence related issues generating uh, diapers as well. So even that waste needs to be segregated completely and kept aside. And for the management of this, Bangalore Municipal Corporation, in collaboration with the Common Treatment Facilities for Biomedical Waste, have put in some systems in place. We'll discuss that, uh, you know, when it comes to the question answer session. Uh, answer session. So. Uh, to summarize, yes, we do generate waste. Yes, we need to segregate the waste that we generate. Segregation is the only solution. Like I mentioned, segregation is the heart. It is the soul and it's the mind of any waste management system that we put. No technology shall work if you do not segregate the waste. Decide upon what non-biodegradable uh, waste that you want to segregate. Decide, do it, put a time frame and go on the journey. And biomedical waste, please ensure that the needles, the broken ampules, and the syringes are separated out from the rest of the biomedical waste. And last but not the least, the sanitary waste in the form of sanitary napkins, diapers, needs to be kept separately. This also is non-negotiable. And there is a system already existent uh, under the BBMP to collect this waste separately. I'll take more questions on this when we uh, go on. And when we do all this, it will certainly help uh, prevent many health-related issues that come out of you know, uh, mismanagement, uh, mismanagement of this waste. 
and segregation certainly uh, will help uh, people, other government agencies to help our communities. Okay, so I end here and uh, I'll be ready to take questions whenever that opportunity comes. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Gaud. And I'm also seeing that we're getting lots of questions from people in the chat window. Uh, 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 please do keep typing in your questions. I'm collating them and we'll have a Q&A right after Dr. Arvind speaks now and uh, we'll try to answer as many as possible. Over to oh. you, Dr. Arvind. Uh, Amar, am I audible now? Yes, you are, sir. We, I can hear Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Yeah, better, sir. Better. Okay, lovely. So uh, that was Dr. Gaud on managing our waste, which, like I said, is the first strategy that we have as we go forward in this COVID-19 pandemic. We want to keep everybody and ourselves uninfected. And a good part of that is when we manage our waste well. The second and third strategies are to take care of people with non-COVID conditions and to ensure that every one of us knows exactly what we need to do if, God forbid, we get symptoms of something which looks like a COVID-like illness. Now, let me go a little into this before we stop and get Q&A happening. Now, our first strategy to keep everybody and ourselves uninfected, in my mind, that has something to do with the way we look after our bodies, but it also has something to do with our minds. And I'll come to that. Body-wise, I think you've seen all these pictures. I think all of you are practicing these things. But let's understand a few things about them. As we go forward, after the lockdown gets lifted, I think that it is very important that we continue doing some of the things that we have learned to do all these days. The first is universal masking. Now, when I say universal masking, it simply means whenever you leave your, your residence, you will be wearing a mask. And why do I say that? In the early days of this epidemic, we were told that masks are to be worn in the general public only by those who have symptoms of respiratory illness. But now we have changed that. We are asking everybody to wear a mask uh, when they move out of their residences because a mask is a great way of preventing infection, preventing those respiratory droplets from going from you to somebody else. It's really more a sign of service you do for others than you do for yourself. It does confer some protection for yourself, but it is much more protection for others when you wear a mask. Hand hygiene. I think all of you know the importance of hand hygiene and repetitively washing your hands, even to a point of obsession. Earlier, we used to think that, you know, our hands get dirty with, with bacteria and germs that we pick up from food and water. And that leads to, you know, diarrhea and stomach upsets and, and stuff like that. But we know now that hand hygiene is equally important for respiratory illness because those droplets have a tendency to, to fall on objects and that and a big object that they fall on is hands. So our hands have to be kept clean and that's why we see so many sanitizers and things kept all over the place. I think it's a good thing. I think we need to keep our hands as clean as possible. Respiratory etiquette simply means the behavior that we have when we develop a cough. And we, we say that when you develop a cough or a sneeze, please try to cough or sneeze into fabric. Now, the, uh, the, the, the teaching now is that you should cough into your elbow. But elbow really means that if you are wearing a full sleeved garment, you're coughing into the fabric in your elbow. So if you don't have, if you're like me right now wearing a half sleeve shirt, that really means cough into your shoulder. Because ultimately, the aim is to cough into fabric. Now, the droplets go into the fabric, they dry up, and the virus loses its potency. That's the logic of coughing into your elbow or into your, uh, into your shirt or into a handkerchief, but not coughing out into the open as far as possible. Distancing is a very simple physical way. Most of the droplets that we're talking about containing the virus are heavy droplets. They don't travel very far. So when you cough or sneeze, those droplets just go for about two feet in the air and drop on the ground, which is why we say that if you keep a, a distance of one meter, which is three feet and above, the chances that you're going to get a droplet from somebody else are much low, lower than if you were closer uh, together. So that's the logic behind 
and distancing. That's the logic also behind avoiding unnecessary gathering because you know that where there are people gathering together, one or two of them is likely to cough. And like I told you, 80% of this infection is asymptomatic, which means there are no symptoms or mild symptoms. You really don't know who is generating virus when he or she coughs or sneezes. So avoiding unnecessary gathering and of course, surface hygiene. Now we'll talk about surfaces because I understand some of your questions are on surfaces. How often should I clean my surface uh, computer screen and mobile screens? We'll talk about that in a moment when I'm done with this. Now let me move on to this. I really think that th this is occupying something of an important sphere in our thinking these days. What we are doing to our mind with respect to coronavirus infection. The first thing that I'd like to say of three things that I want to say is don't panic. Remember that it's a mild asymptomatic illness in most cases. There is no need for a sense of paranoia. And that unfortunately many times leads to the second step, which is ostracizing or shunning people. Now that's not what we want to do. When we say that we want all to be aware, that we want to maintain a distance, that we want to wear a mask, that doesn't mean we break down our social contact and completely shun and ostracize other people. What is required is awareness and behavior change on the part of everybody. So everybody understands, but we don't have a negative connotation here, especially like this, which is let's, let's, we, we, we don't want to, to, re, to be hostile towards somebody else, to, to kind of uh, treating them like untouchables. We want to say, let's understand what this is. Let's show concern for everybody. And this part is in the mind. And I think all of us need to keep this in mind as we go on. Well, the second strategy, the first one, remember, was how to keep ourselves and everybody uninfected. And that's what I spoke about so far. The second strategy is to ensure that those who have non-COVID conditions must also be taken care of in this time. Now, this is a quotation from a journal article which says, prior experience from the Ebola pandemic of 2014-15 showed that deaths due to neglect of measles, malaria, HIV, and TB were far more in number than Ebola deaths themselves during the pandemic. Now, that just shows you what we're talking about. There are women and children out there who need care and support for whatever illness or, 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 or condition that they suffer from. We know that there are people with chronic disease, cancer perhaps, BP, high blood pressure perhaps, diabetes, whatever it is. And of course, the elderly, whom we know have a, usually suffer from, a, from one, two or more chronic conditions. So we need to ensure that these people still get care that they deserve, even in the times of COVID-19. The third strategy is that all of us should know exactly what we should do if, God forbid, we get symptoms suggestive of COVID-like illness. Now, here's a man who's got cough, cold, and fever, what we call the ILI syndrome or influenza-like illness syndrome. What is he supposed to do? What are you in your apartment supposed to do? Now, there are a host of options that you have. Now, most hospitals have started offering teleconsultations. There are fever clinics set up by a lot of municipal corporations, including our own BBMP. There are screening clinics at the larger hospitals. Your regular doctors, of course, I'm, I'm, I assume you are in touch with, with them. And most local corporations have a local helpline number in Bangalore. That number is 104. So the first thing that you need to do is reach out to any of these options and see what they say. Now, they may say one of two things. It doesn't look like COVID-19. We will treat you like how we would treat a common cold or any other flu-like syndrome. And we will observe. We will keep in touch with you and see what happens. But the other option is this looks like it could be coronavirus symptoms. So perhaps then we move to testing. Now, the Indian Council of Medical Research has given us a set of criteria which hospitals follow for testing. If you satisfy one of those criteria, you will be given a test. And again, there are two possibilities. One is it's negative. In that case, you are sent home, you are cautioned about all the precautions that you need to take, and you're kept under observation. But assume that that test is positive. Now, if that test is positive, 
then we need to really move. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. This has changed. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So if that test is positive, then it's possible again that even as a coronavirus infection, you have a very mild illness, you have moderate levels of symptoms, or unfortunately, you have severe symptoms. Now, the government has laid down these kind of centers. Now, CCC is a community COVID center, a designated COVID health center, and a designated COVID-19 hospital. That's what these, these abbreviations stand for. And that's where ultimately perhaps you will be kept and treated while your family uh, is quarantined and kept uh, under observation and your contacts are traced, screened, tested and quarantined. So this is, this is what will happen if somebody gets any symptoms of COVID-like illness. So as a take home message, I'm focusing still on our first strategy. We need to remember that our body and our mind need to be perfect. Our body with respect to masking, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, distancing. I won't call it social distancing. There is a body of people who don't like that term because it seems to suggest that we are socially ostracizing or isolating. So I will just say distancing or physical distancing avoiding unnecessary gatherings and cleaning, keeping our surfaces as far as possible clean. And in the mind, don't panic, don't shun, don't ostracize, don't be hostile. But remember, we are in a community. As an apartment, we have many people living together. So let's be positive. Let's smile at each other. And, and together, we will try to beat this pandemic. And I do believe we can and we will. So these are the questions that we got uh, from you. I've just kind of put them into, into sort of boxes which, which, which sound similar. Uh, I will start off perhaps with, with addressing these. Amar, is that okay? Can I start off with addressing these questions and then we'll get some more as we go on? Yes, so, so we can jump into the Q&A now. And uh, you can start with these questions, Dr. Arvind. And I, I'm also noting down the questions people are sending now. To, and we'll see if some, some of them are covered already when you guys speak of the questions that you have. Okay. And otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll ask you questions as we go as well. Perfect. Yeah. So these were some of the questions that we got before this webinar, which is uh, one of the gentlemen I think asked about the changing profile of symptoms that we are seeing in this COVID-19 illness. Well, really, uh, one must remember it's a viral illness which has a very wide spectrum. Uh, like I said, many people are just asymptomatic, which means they don't manifest at all. Some of them have very mild symptoms. And as we go on, we are learning more and more about the spectrum of this illness. And recently, the CDC in the US has released a series of additional symptoms which people have encountered all over the world, which include shivering, uh, shaking or chills, headache, intense fatigue, and a loss of smell, which of course we knew about already. But uh, yes, sir, to whoever asked this question, there is a changing, not a changing profile, I wouldn't call it a changing profile, I would say additional symptoms are being noticed as we go on in this pandemic. It's a fact, yes. Well, this next set of questions has to do with virus on surfaces, common items like newspaper and packaging, and a virus on clothes. Now, let's remember, like I told you, the virus is carried in small droplets. Those droplets have the predilection to land on surfaces. Now, when that surface is clean, polished, smooth, like a plastic surface, a stainless steel surface, a metal surface, the virus lasts longer. And people say that they, it lasts for up to three days or even four days. The virus can exist in a living form on those surfaces, which is why we say that for those kind of surfaces, please ensure that you clean them as often as possible with simple soap and water, that should do. Or if you have a, a, a household cleaning solution which contains alcohol, that's good enough as well. But let's move on to paper. Paper, packaging and cardboard. Generally, the life of the virus on these surfaces is much less. It is believed to last between four hours to a few hours more than that on surfaces like this. Now, again, there's another very, very important point that I'd like all of you to carry out as you go out of this webinar. Just because a virus particle is found on a surface, that doesn't necessarily mean that transmission of illness will result. 
So remember that also. Just because a newspaper or a cardboard surface has a virus particle present on it, which is there for an hour or two, that doesn't necessarily mean that it transmits it. So as far as newspaper and packaging is concerned, it is generally believed that the risk of transmission is very, very, very low. So please, if you follow ordinary precautions, like I told you, uh, the, remember the, the small pictures that I put up, I think that you needn't worry about newspaper and packaging being sources of transmission. Clothes. Now, virus transmission from clothing, again, very, very low possibility of transmission. The question really was that if we go out and come back, do we have to change all our clothes and wear a totally different set of clothes and have a bath? I think that's taking it to a little extreme. I think that if we maintain hand hygiene, masking, uh, distancing, respiratory etiquette, we should be okay with not changing our clothes every time we come, uh, having gone outside our apartment. Now, the next set of questions was to do with sanitation solutions, fumigation, hygiene, do's and don'ts. The fumigation that is being followed by, by municipal corporations consists of spreading a solution called hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite solution at a 1% concentration. That is believed, I mean, uh, there is no doubt that that solution kills the virus, neutralizes it immediately. So that's the reason why municipal corporations are using uh, fumigants uh, whenever they know that a locality or an area has got a case. Uh, I guess it's a case of overkill, really, just spraying fumigant all over the place and hoping for it's like a carpet bombing situation for an individual or two in a locality. But yes, those fumigants do kill the virus in answer to your question. Uh, also, uh, remember that if you want to make a solution of bleach at home, uh, there are commercially available solutions containing sodium hypochlorite, but one item that we find commonly at home is bleaching powder, and we get a lot of questions on how we use bleaching powder. Well, uh, uh, the ratio of water, for one liter of water, it is recommended that you can put about a teaspoonful of bleaching powder, shake it up, and you've got a solution which contains enough bleach to neutralize the virus. And that solution will last for about 24 hours if you kept, keep it bottled. So that's, that's a simple sanitation solution that you can prepare. If, if you need. Uh, the other questions were to do with outbreaks within an apartment community. Now that's a fairly important occurrence if it happens. And I guess that the solution to that is going to lie with your local health authority, wherever you are, and what they do in response. They will probably move in, they will probably quarantine, they will probably give you instructions as to what you should do. I would suggest that that's the way to go. Uh, there were a, question, a couple of questions about post-lockdown situation. I guess I'll stop here and keep those questions for the last bit of what we speak, the last two or three minutes of this webinar. I'll hand you back to Amar. Amar, go ahead. And Dr. Uh, Gaur. Th thank you, Dr. Arvind and uh, Dr. Gaur. That was uh, uh, great information. Uh, just because uh, you just spoke about surfaces, uh, Dr. Arvind, so there was a question that I saw uh, on the chat about what about virus being in uh, vegetables and greens that people are buying in fruits? Uh, is that something we need to be worried about and what to do in that case, uh, in that situation? Uh, I think uh, vegetables and fruits, we have our usual hygiene practice, which is when you buy vegetables and fruits, you wash them. And I guess the same, I think the most important ingredient that all of us need in our fight against coronavirus 19 is common sense. And, and I say this again and again to our medical students, to our health care workers, and to the general public, and to myself and my own family members. Let's use our common sense. Now, when we buy vegetables and fruits, our practice is to wash them before we use them, or before, even before we store them. I think when we continue washing them, maybe with soap and water, if possible, you are completely removing all viruses from that surface. Yes, Amar. Okay. Uh, the, and, and more questions. Uh, I'm just, because there are so many questions pouring in, I'm just trying to bucket them the best I can. Uh, so this one is for Dr. Gaud, actually, uh, where uh, people are feeling, uh, so a quarantined home, if there is a, 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 a home which is kept under quarantine, uh, should their waste, uh, Dr. Gaud, be treated uh, uh, differently from the rest of the community? And does that 
ways fall under biomedical, like all the ways they generate, does it fall under biomedical category? If you can just uh, let us know. Okay. Yeah. So if it's a quarantined uh, locality, uh, the rules of uh, waste management do not change, actually. Right. We still need to do whatever I have told earlier. The, bi the biodegradable waste, not biodegradable waste, and the medical waste, uh, the way I have mentioned. So the rules don't change at all. So that let's just be very clear about it. One, number two, in a quarantine situation, uh, there is a mandate uh, given by the government to the local urban local bodies or uh, to the panchayats when if the if and when the virus goes there, that they have to take up a little bit of a responsibility for the picking up of the waste. So I'll speak to uh, in context of Bangalore. In Bangalore, the quarantine locati localities, the uh, uh, it's the municipal corporation's responsibility to see that the waste from there is picked up. And the municipal uh, corporation uh, will have a tie up with the common treatment facility people. There is biomedical waste, common treatment facility people. So they are the ones who will manage the medical waste that comes out of the uh, of this locality. And as regards to the general solid waste, it is still it, it, it will still be the our municipal corporation. It, it will go the usual way. So there is no other special precaution. So it's, it's just that the medical waste from that localities will be picked up uh, by the urban local body separately, and they will have a tie up with the uh, common treatment facility, wherein all of the biomedical waste, including from the hospitals, will go and get uh, processed. Uh, but one minute, Dr. Dodd, just wanted to check. Uh, most apartment people want to know uh, if I have medical waste uh, from a COVID kind of quarantined house, is there, that has to be treated uh, with care? I mean, do I have to have three packets? Uh, who should touch it? Uh, how long should it store? we store it in the apartment? Um, those are the, uh, people have doubts like that. Okay. So is there no. a light you can shed on that? Okay, so if there's a, so there won't be a COVID-19 patient in our quarantine facilities. If it is a COVID-19 diagnosed patient, that patient is in the hospital. Okay, let's be very clear about it. Uh, and even in the hospital for the COVID-19 waste that we generate, the biomedical waste, the existing systems are in operation. It's just that we have an extra label and an extra packaging material to indicate that it is COVID-19 waste. Even in the hospital, we are not doing anything differently. Coming back to the household, there are no additional extra precautions that we need to take. Just like Dr. Arvind just now mentioned, if the household is using the masks very specifically, they have to keep the mask separately. And if the household is OK with it, they can deposit these uh, masks in a, a home prepared bleach solution kind of a thing. That adds, that's an extra precaution that they have to take. Otherwise, there won't be uh, any great difference in how this waste will be managed at home. Acha, so you're saying that if I'm using disposable masks, I can put it into this bleach solution and uh, then put it out in a, a brown paper packet, double brown paper packet or newspaper packet and mark it red. Good mark it Is red, just like the way we, are, we may be doing for our sanitary napkins. Sanitary as well. napkins. And, and it would go with the sanitary napkins. So, so, so one of the things that lots of apartments are, are not able to yet do is to uh, separate sanitary waste collection. So you are, you are re-emphasizing now in the light of COVID also and anyway you were re-emphasizing it before also. Medical, sanitary, right? Isn't that clear? So, so what you're saying is it's very important to keep sanitary waste and medical waste separate. Absolutely. Yeah. So san uh, let me uh, just so that there's no confusion, Poonamji. Uh, here is an opportunity for us in this situation. And let me focus on this situation. In this situation, let's put our sanitary napkins, baby diapers, and any other, uh, you know, the cotton papers, other things, or any other uh, bedspread kind of a thing that we may use for a person who is not able to get out of the bed or a baby. Along with this waste, let also the masks go. If we are, we, we are generating masks as well. All of these things can go into a newspaper or a brown cover or a double brown, or double brown covered brown papers or, uh, you know, the multiple wrappings of newspaper and let it be marked X and let it be kept separately. And this will certainly be picked up by the common treatment facility. And the municipal corporation will facilitate doing this. And COVID-19 has given us uh, this opportunity. We have been struggling the, with this for the last three, four years, more so in the last two years. And it was initially piloted. People have given up. 
uh, gave up on this, but let's rejuvenate this. It's an opportunity for us to bring back that system, and uh, you know, and even beyond COVID nineteen days, uh, it will help us. Right. So, so uh, one, more. one more question uh, I would like to ask. Uh, can I? Uh, uh, if you can type it in, uh, uh, Mr. Danta, into the chat window, that will. Uh, I mean, uh, actually, I mean, <laughs> I want to type. So, I mean, my, some problem is in my mobile. So sure, sure. Type. Please go ahead. Please so, go ahead. Uh, See, actually, uh, people are saying that if we keep the newspaper or whatever bags which we are going out and coming back, if it is affected with COVID, suppose if I'm passing through a COVID affected area and if I'm keeping the bag, I'm using the bag, that bag, if I keep it in sunlight for two hours, uh, that uh, virus dies. Is it true or uh, how to go about it? Uh, this is question number one. Question number two is, uh, suppose if a mask, uh, mask they are using, whether N95 mask is really required, or shall I use my handkerchief, double, uh, uh, I mean, double layered uh, handkerchief to use as a mask and then reuse it? This is two questions I can Sir, would you like to answer that, sir? Because you spoke on the cough etiquette and masks. Or shall I answer it? No, 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 I'll go ahead. No problem. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gaud. Uh, thank you, madam. Yeah, two questions on uh, first is I think uh, basically it boils down to sunlight and the effect of sunlight on the virus. Yes, there is no doubt that if there is a virus particle on a piece of cloth and we expose that cloth to direct sunlight, the virus particle will die in an hour or two. There is no doubt about that. But again, uh, let us not take that to uh, further and further and try to expose uh, many things to sunlight and believe that uh, all is well. Uh, exposing to sunlight is okay, but remember washing soap and water that still remains the gold standard for washing any even item of cloth. I would recommend that over exposure to sunlight. The second question, what was the second question? I'm sorry, I missed it. Mask, um, the use of masks. Yeah, the use of masks. Madam, N95 masks is a very precious commodity at this point in the healthcare world. And I don't think that we should be using N95 masks among the general communities outside of a healthcare setting. In fact, there are three types of masks which we are talking about. One is the N95 mask, which in, at this point in time, I would think is for the use of healthcare workers, simply because they are, their likelihood of contact with COVID-19 is much higher. So that's the reason why in a healthcare environment, like a hospital, we advocate the use of N95 masks. The second type of mask is a surgical mask. Now a surgical mask we see now being used fairly uh, widely outside even of the healthcare setting. But origin in its original avatar, even the surgical mask was supposed to be intended for use in the healthcare uh, environment by the healthcare workers as they sit in outpatient settings, perhaps and interact with the general public. Now, the third type of mask is the one that we recommend for widespread use, which is a triple layered cloth mask. In other words, simple cloth, but three layers of it, uh, put one behind the other, is the kind of mask that we recommend for the general public. And using a good triple layered cloth mask, in fact, Dr. Gowd's mobile phone, for those of you who are in contact with him, he's got his DP on this, which is the risk of transmission when you wear a mask and when you don't wear a mask. Now, if you wear a, a triple layered mask like of the type I spoke about, and you have a mild COVID-like illness and you are generating respiratory droplets with the virus and you wear a mask, even if another person is not wearing a mask and you are in contact with that person, the risk of transmission drops from almost 70 plus percent to just 15 or 10%. And when that person is wearing a mask as well, that risk of transmission drops even further. So, uh, Mrs. Ajanta, in answer to your question, N95 masks, I really wouldn't recommend. A triple layered cloth mask is the way to go because they can be recycled, they can be reused, they can be washed, they can be dried, they can be disinfected and worn again. Uh, thank you. Doctor, how much, how many times do you disinfect the mask, that uh, triple layer cotton usable mask? Well, again, uh, I would think that uh, we must look at the mask and its integrity. If you think that in about two or three washes, the integrity of the cloth is starting to wear off, change the mask. 
because it's after all just a cotton fabric that no but how often do i uh, wash it in a day like in the okay. sense every day yeah well that uh, that's again definitely once a day but the the thing to look for in a cotton mask is if it has become damp if it has become damp then the time has come to wash it within the day but even if it hasn't become damp at the end of the day you will wash it once a day is what you would wash a mask at least amar sure uh one more uh, 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 this is for everybody in the in, in the interest of time as well because we're only at 12:7 uh, we have had lots of questions around composting uh maggots during composting where to compost in the community uh, so we just quickly saying that we are daily dump actually just do that that's our bread and butter for the last 14 years uh, uh i will note down my email id and phone number in the chat box uh, i request all the communities to get in touch with us Uh, because that's a different long conversation again deciding a place to compost and composting as a solution but as dr god has already another webinar also amar that's yes. the following yes we will be doing another webinar on exactly that there'll be one hour session on composting that will be done so we'll be taking it there uh, but meanwhile we'll uh, uh, call the other questions uh, that have uh, uh, come up uh, dr arvind since you mentioned about uh, Uh, about mass so there were a few questions that i saw that people are worried that the uh, uh, there's a general feeling that the number of mass and gloves and all these kind of things being used by people is increasing so is there uh, uh, you think the system is equipped to take or handle uh, so much biomedical waste that's coming out and even when you go out and walk in lanes you can actually now nowadays see mass lying around on uh, on footpaths so what is your take on on that we got a couple of such questions too well uh, i think uh, all of us uh, in the newspapers and in the media in fact globally are seeing that there's a huge what we call personal protective equipment or ppe crisis globally which is that we do not have the amount of ppe i mean personal protective equipment that the healthcare industry or the healthcare workers workforce requires at this time so mostly the 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 discussion on ppe is in the realm of the healthcare industry now your question of course is the use of masks and gloves among the general public or in the community like i said the only kind of mask that is required in the general public is a simple three layered cloth mask and that is made of cotton fabric so uh, i don't think that uh, we are too concerned about widespread use of cotton fabric in the community however disposal of mask disposal of whatever we use is an important issue and i and i uh, i take what dr gout said in the beginning which is that we have to manage our waste responsibly now that that is a seen car no that 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 cuts across whatever we are talking about but in answer to the use of masks in the general public i think if we restrict it to triple layer cloth masks Platinum. and do not uh, go beyond that and start to think that everybody has to start wearing goggles and visors and uh, rubber gloves all the time uh, we don't need that so uh, i think that the kind of protection that we are talking about in the general public it's okay to use cotton masks yeah amar all right uh, so there was one more uh, uh, thing around housekeeping staff health because that's a big thing in apartments where they have uh, staff that comes in every day collects waste from each household uh, manages it segregates it so i saw a couple of questions on the chat and also on our list uh, uh, this is with you dr gaud that uh, what are the best practices you think in uh, small knit apartment communities uh, where housekeeping staff are coming in every day to work what do the what how can the apartment ensure that they are uh, uh, given the best possible circumstances to work okay so uh, like in the hospitals we do uh, the people who manage uh, our apartment complexes the the housekeeping staff they also should be treated like the way uh, the kind of facilities that we extend to uh, our housekeeping staff in the hospitals but the only thing here is dr arvin mentioned common sense and application but they have to be treated uh, you know Uh, on the same uh, you know level the protective uh, with regards to the precautions they must take yes the first and foremost is if any of the staff member has cough cold fever cough cold and symptoms uh, uh, covid 19 like symptoms uh, then they must be discouraged uh, to come to work they must be asked to go and see a care provider so please ensure that it's a general uh, you know on the loud speaker to everybody in the community any any of their people it can be the uh, 
uh, from the contractor who is managing the, the apartment complex or an individual health uh, housemaid uh, who is coming into the houses. If anybody is sick and they have symptoms such as fever, cold, cough, sore throat, they must not be allowed to come into the community. One. Number two, they must go to a medical facility and show themselves. This is uh, very important. Number three, yes, they need to be provided with uh, um, gloves. Then they need to be provided with uh, soap and uh, soap for have washing hands. And also maybe equip them with uh, uh, the sanitizers, which are kept in, in the places where they, where they work. And in some select three or four places within the comp uh, apartment complex. So these are the general uh, precautions. Uh, otherwise, we don't have to really panic. So that also is an occupation and we too are going into our houses. So we all have to be just be up there and antennas going up and be on the lookout for the symptoms and just behave normally with heightened sense of uh, alertness, hand washing, uh, coffee ticket, hand washing and distancing are the key uh, points here as well. Okay, great. And just to hold that thought one minute, apartments, the best practice is Dr. Gaud would be if you enter a community, should you wash your hands before you enter the community? People are even asking things like, should I spray fumigation to cars that are coming from outside? You know, these there are all kinds of thoughts, right? So, but for the people, if you just concentrate on people, if uh, housekeeping staff or vegetable vendor, anybody, anybody from outside comes in, would you, would you recommend that they wash their hands at the time of entry? And then when they go before uh, entering into anybody's house, they again wash their hands. What is what is the best practice? And when before they uh, leave, they wash and go? Okay. So I... Uh, can I, uh, can I take yeah. uh, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Let me reflect upon an incident. Uh, an elderly <laughs> person actually called me and said that tomorrow we are having an electrician come in to repair something. And there is an elderly couple staying in this house. So uh, she appeared to be in a state of some uh, uh, distress, saying that he's actually going to come to our house. Now, what do we do? What do we do? Because the husband has got a history of respiratory illness. He's got a few comorbidities and he's an elderly person. I, 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 while I answered her, I appreciated the fact that she is concerned. So uh, all of us need to have a sense of concern, saying that, OK, this is an unusual time. There is this viral illness going along. So what exactly, how do we deal with this? And now let me expand that to saying that as the lockdown is lifted, all apartment communities are asking the question, do maids, drivers, etc., restart their duties and start coming in as well? I think that the answer to this, again, is simple. And we just have to ensure that everybody is on alert. Now, what does that mean? Yes, Poonam, I agree with you. When people enter the dwelling, they must wash their hands with soap and water. It has to happen or they can sanitize their hands with 70% uh, alcohol-based sanitizers. So one way or the other, they wash their hands and ensure that the hands are absolutely clean. They wear a mask mandatorily. Everybody entering an apartment block has to wear a mask. So masking, hand, uh, hand hygiene, and the third question when they enter the apartment is about respiratory symptoms. Now, if any one of them, in fact, actually has a respiratory symptom, which could be a cough or a cold or a fever, I would think that their entry should be restricted till such time they have visited a care provider and that care provider has ruled out everything and said, no problem, you can go on. Even at that point, they continue wearing a mask. The mask is, is universal and continuous and consistent. So if they wash their hands, if they are free from any respiratory symptoms, if they continuously wear a mask, and if the receiving apartment or dwelling also practices the same behaviors, which is they also wash their hands periodically, they also wear masks continuously, they sanitize their surfaces, whichever they have come in contact with periodically. I mean, I'm not saying let's be obsessive. Every 15 minutes, we keep spraying sanitizer on all our surfaces. No, that's not what we are saying. But we are saying, let's have commonsensical precautions. Now, this electrician, for example, I told that lady, when he attends to your computer or modem or whatever it is you called him for, and when he leaves your dwelling and he goes, perhaps those areas which he has attended to, just wipe down with soapy water. 
Now you would be dusting it anyway. I'm, all we are saying is use wet dusting with soapy water. So if we observe those kind of precautions, and I also told her one, what I thought was a very important point. Don't treat that guy badly. Don't make him feel like an untouchable. When he comes to your house, all of you shy away from him. Don't do that. That's, that's, that's not being human in a time like this. Remember, he is as worried about getting the infection from you as you are from him. In fact, uh, many people dwelling out there are even more scared of people living in apartment uh, complexes and others than you are of them. So let's all be concerned for each other. Let's be positive, smiling, but let us all be very aware and not let our guard down on the precautions that we take. I think if we do all that, Amar and Poonam, you should be able to open your dwellings to people coming in. Just that all of us are cautious and, and aware. Okay. Dr. Sir, yeah, sir, uh, just to uh, add to what you just said, sir, uh, maybe we can look at this, like sir mentioned, from a macro environment, people coming into our my apartment and people coming into, into the gates of the community. So make a distinction between the two and set out norms as to what they should be, uh, be doing. So people, when they enter my house, like Dr. Arvind just now mentioned, uh, will uh, ask the person to, of course, wear a mask. He has to enter a house wearing a mask. We, we, we welcome him with, uh, uh, into the place where you have kept the detergent for him to wash hands. He will wash hands and then he will go about uh, doing his work. Once his work is done, even while he exits, our even while he is exiting our house, we will again lead him to the hand washing spot. We will ask him to wash hands and get out. So this way, I think it equalizes. You know, uh, that human, human thing is, while I made you wash hands when you came into house, I also take cognizance that you may be taking something from my home. So just wash it that away in my house only and then get out. So few commonsensical three, four points such as this uh, thing uh, will uh, help. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this, uh, Dr. Alvin, there's one thing. Should you wash your uh, vegetables with haldi or soap and water? If some people are saying haldi. Some people are saying... And another question just to add up to that is that a lot of uh, ecologically minded people are asking two questions. In case I don't want to sanitize with... Uh, uh, alcohol-based uh, cleaners, can I use bioenzyme cleaners? So we need these answers from both of you. Okay, well, uh, uh, turmeric, the use of, I know that turmeric is an antioxidant. It's, it's got a lot of uh, very good properties. But washing using turmeric, well, I don't know. The answer is that allopathic medicine does not know that. Soap and water, absolutely fine. 70% alcohol is an option. I mean, if people want to use alcohol-based sanitizers, they can. But according to me, and the thing that Dr. Gaud and me keep repeating to our community is simple soap and water. So about turmeric, I will not be able to answer. I'm sorry. Uh, Bioenzymes uh, bio -enzymes also, I don't think at this point we have an answer about whether bioenzyme is a, is a good way to clean. I would just recommend that till such time this, the uh, uh, pandemic kind of at least shows signs of settling, which we anticipate is another month, two, three away. Let's use soap and water, which is a simple, easily available, fairly acceptable thing. Yes. Uh, the, yes. Uh, yeah. Dr. Yes. Uh, other, yeah, sir, the other cleaning, you, sir, other cleaning can, uh, practice use. can be, the other cleaning practice can also be you know, uh, uh, blanching, we can, uh, 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 the vegetables can be uh, washed with uh, soak, uh, soaked in hot water, or rather warm water, laced with salt, which we have been doing. It, it is a household practice. So the fruits and the vegetables can be soaked in, uh, uh, in warm water, laced with salt. That is one option. And you can also explore the possibility of using vinegar uh, for, uh, you know, uh, taking the dirt and the muck from the vegetables and the fruit. That also helps. Does the sanitizing, tunnel sanitizing help in the gate, entry gates? Uh, sorry, sir. Tunnel sanitizing. Uh, okay. tunnel sanitizing. So sanitation tunnels. Sanitation tunnels is different. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Does it help? Well, sir, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know. When I see a person being subjected to that, that mm -hmm. is, he or she is mandatorily expected to walk through that 
and is sprayed uh, from all sides with bleach i think that it is uh, overkill i don't think that that kind of uh, treatment must be given every time consistently for everybody who enters uh, an apartment block like i said i think that if a if a person cleans his or her hands with soap and water maintains continuous masking and periodically repeats uh, hand sanitization uh, that should do i don't think that everybody entering an apartment complex should go through a tunnel sanitizer i don't think that that's required okay and just to add to what dr arvin mentioned uh, sanitation tunnels are a no no now okay they are not an option anymore because uh, we haven't had the good experiences of using the sanitation tunnels uh, anywhere they are used so at this point of time no and uh, just keep uh, uh, in mind what dr arvin that mentioned okay uh, i also saw that there were questions uh, around people asking oh, oh we have this problem in our neighborhood how do we reach out to the uh, authorities uh, again for that uh, please reach out to us separately i had given in my email id and phone number and we'll be able to uh, maybe help you uh, uh, find answers to your waste problems around your society and, and and things like that but again in the interest of time we are almost at 12 22 uh, uh, now uh so just just the just the last thing uh, uh for example dr arvin that we were discussing before you mentioned about optimism in general and on how yeah. cautious and how optimist uh, and and would uh, and you mentioned is cautious well informed optimism going to carry us through this uh, the the whole the, the virus situation and what about the the sense of community uh, do you do you think uh, uh it's going to come back and and, and uh, now that the lockdown is going to be lifted people are asking Oh, um, should we be like really worried and uh, and be prepared for the virus and things like that? So, if just your thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, uh, sir. Yes. Sir, also, uh, sir. Also, uh, please add to your suggestions. What should be the sources of information? Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. In fact, uh, I'll ask Dr. Gaud to speak about that after just after I finish what I have to say. Uh, yes. Absolutely right. I mean, very very important. This is what I wanted to end this webinar with. which is what exactly is going to happen in the future i think all of us have that uh, that that nagging business of is this all that it's going to be i mean is life going to be like this forever and ever uh, are we ever going to get rid of this thing well i i would love to be a nostradamus and say exactly on august 15th we will <laughs> celebrate independence from coronavirus but uh, i need to be realistic for that i'm asking all of you to remember one simple thing which is that this is a viral illness which is transmissible like the common cold now do you think that an illness like that when we lift the lockdown and people start to mingle do you think that they will get infected with this virus well the common sensical answer to that is yes whether we like it or not we are going to see an upsurge in the number of people who get infection the only thing that we are hoping for is that we will try to minimize that as much as possible by following what i asked you to keep in mind with your body and mind if each of us do what we have to do which is hand hygiene masking respiratory etiquette distancing avoiding unnecessary social gathering if we do those things i think that we can definitely prevent a lot of transmission from happening but transmission is going to happen we know our country we know our people we know our crowds we know that the kind of uh, transmissibility of this virus is going to mean that transmission is going to happen so for a few months ahead at least we are going to be prepared for every day's newspaper saying there are so many more cases there are so many more cases but don't worry remember 85 to 90% of the time this is a viral i mean mild viral illness it's just like a common cold or a flu it's just a a a respiratory sniffle a light sore throat a fever for a day or two perhaps and then it's all over it's only that population who are elderly who have comorbidities like diabetes high blood pressure those are the people that we need to pick up our phones and keep calling if there are parents there are family members we should keep talk to them every day and say how are you doing are you following these things because you we want you to be well and that's the way forward 
going ahead in this epidemic. We need to take care of ourselves by following those things. We need to take care of those vulnerable people who, who are at higher risk of infection by reaching out to them, not by shunning them and isolating them, but by reaching out to them in the many ways which social media give us. And we need to keep in touch. And going forward, cautious, informed optimism. That's the term that we were talking about. Yes, I really believe that all of us need to be positive. We need not be hostile. We need not be aggressive to one another. Horrible incidents like the one we heard about where a, a person, I mean, a doctor who had passed away wasn't allowed to bury, to, to have a decent burial. Now, that's an example of aggression simply because people are all panicking and are perhaps not well informed. So cautious, well informed, but optimism, positivity, and continuously not reducing our guard is the way to go forward. I think that our apartment communities can do it. Remember that everybody is in this together. Look at people with friendship. Look at people as people who, what can I do for this guy? He's not wearing a mask. Should I talk to him about it? Should I give him one? Should I tell him about it? Rather than saying, let me avoid this guy and go away. Let me, I have nothing to do with him. I hate this man. That's not the way in which we need to conduct our lives going forward. And that's the message which I wanted to give in the end. Dr. Gaud will tell us about where we can get information, more information about COVID-19 as we go on. Yes, Dr. Yes, sir. Among the four things that you mentioned, so you mentioned about uh, uh, being informed. So our, the, the sources of information at this point of time should be the official government of India and the respective state government websites. This should be our primary sources of inf infection. Uh, so we are a free country. There are many people who write. They have a right to who write everything that they are writing. But having said that, as a citizen at this point of time, let's bank upon uh, information from the government websites. You know, the government of India official website, the National Center for Disease Control website, it gives regular updates about the, you know, the number of cases and related things. And most importantly, from a community dwelling, uh, you know, apartment uh, kind of a residential uh, places, there are also on and off guidelines even for the residential complexes. Uh, also in these guidelines uh, that the government publishes. And at the state level, the, I also see some of our people who are with us on this webinar from the other states. So those of you are in other states other than Karnataka, please uh, bank on the official, uh, your respective state websites. And in Karnataka state, our official uh, health and welfare department website is karnadu.karnataka.gov.in. So basically what I'm trying to say is let our primary sources of our information be the government and government sources because that is most credible and that is uh, that is that should be the way forward that's all uh, thank you thank you dr god and dr arvind uh, and and again we are uh, so much thankful for you guys to join us today uh, and 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 we salute you as medical community you know uh, because i'm sure you guys are the ones who are going out there and helping uh, uh, citizens get better going to the hospitals every day and, uh, and it's something we forget sitting in our homes and staring at blank screens sometimes. But thank you so much for doing that. And our pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Yes. And, and uh, now we are, we are at 12.30 and it's almost lunchtime. So the last thing we have is we have uh, Poonam who's already asked us a few questions. Poonam, if you have any, any, anything on top of your head that you would like to add to uh, uh, what the doctors have mentioned, uh, please. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I won't take up too much of my time. I just want to first of all thank both the doctors. Like uh, Amar says, you guys are at the front, uh, forefront and uh, the message that you've given us today is really, really important because you have given us a good balance of uh, uh, what are the facts, but you've also given us the mindset which we need to be able to tackle this. And like you said, it's not going to go away and we need to become even more positive and we need to not shun people. I thought that was a really great takeaway. I also like Dr. Gaud's thing about what are not negotiable in terms of your, your uh, medical practices. I just want to make uh, uh, two things that are uh, uh, the takeaway for, uh, for us also after working for so long in waste. Uh, we have this crisis. The COVID is there. What are we doing? We are reacting to it. And we've, we've got all these guidelines. We know we have to make masks. We have to do this. Uh, this is how we have to treat each other. So we, we know that part. Okay. So there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of uh, 
um, a lot of, in fact, money flowing into projects where we have to tackle this new space. But I also want to place some, some uh, impact. I think we should also reflect. We, of course, we have to do that. We have to tackle it. We have to react to it. We have to take pictures of this. But there is a big chunk, which is called precaution and understanding the bigger picture. My question, there, were, uh, there was one question on this uh, the chat about uh, that drains and sewers have got a lot of non-biodegradable waste. You know, we have to, this is a moment when we ask ourselves, the COVID actually came is a zootonic kind of virus. Why did it come? It came because we didn't understand our relationship with ecology. It came because we've destroyed so much habitat and we destroyed it because we have certain needs. So this is also a time when we say, okay, how much can I change? Can I start using uh, washable uh, sanitary pads or menstrual cups? Can I start using washippers for my children? Can I start looking at uh, not using tissue papers, but going back to hankies? Can, can I even the masks that I have? I have, am I so lazy that I can't wash my own masks and I have to go and pick up the surgical mask? There's so much pollution that's happening because of those things that we are throwing out. So I feel there are two things that uh, this is asking us to do. This moment is asking us to become smart and take precautions against what we are witnessing. But it's also asking us to think of our larger connection with e the ecosystem around us. And we have to make those changes happen. We have to say there are certain things I need to change at home, like wearing a mask is a change for COVID. Changing a habit of from plastics and disposables to something that is more eco-friendly is very important. That's the only thing I'd like to end with. And I'd like to also thank uh, Apartment Adda for partnering with us because it's been a really great partnership. We had uh, lots of people join us and uh, I want to thank all the participants today. And another big round of thanks to both the doctors. Uh, thank Hi. you so much, Poonam. And uh, I, we'd like to end at that. And there's a lot of food for thought <laughs> for myself as well. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to put my email ID and phone number again in the chat box for everybody who's still on. Uh, any more queries, please flood us with emails and WhatsApp messages. Uh, we are ready for that. And, uh, and we'll, we'll hopefully see you in the next webinar with the details of which will be shared with you very soon. And you'll hear from us regarding this webinar also. And please feel free to give us feedback uh, and uh, uh, share more uh, as a community. And uh, we are all in this together, as Dr. Arvind said. And thank you so much for joining. Uh, Amar, uh, just two minutes as a bonus, please. Uh, yeah. Stand here, co-founder of Adda. Uh, Dr. Gaud and Dr. Arvind, thank you very much. One thing that Dr. Gaud said, and I see a lot of faces who have been in our numerous uh, solid waste management workshops, is that this is an opportunity, right? The sensitivity for people on hygiene is very high. So, so many practices that all these managers, I see Divakar, I see uh, uh, Mr. Sridhar, they are managers, you know, who handle large apartment communities. I'm sure they've been trying to implement a lot of good solid waste management uh, practices which did not happen. Because people were not sensitized enough. They said, okay, who cares? But now people care okay, about all these things. So I think this is a great opportunity. Let's grab it. Let us figure out what to enforce and uh, get it done. Uh, we will be putting all these knowledge uh, items together and find out clear guidelines that communities can utilize. Right? And we are so happy, doctors and uh, daily dumps, that this is the first uh, time we are doing our workshop online. You see people from Calcutta, Pune, Chennai and all. So they've always asked us, hey, your workshops are always in Bangalore. Hamare yaha pe bhi karo. You know, do it in our place. We are thankful to Corona that they've showed us a way. Right? Because it's in India. Yeah, and apartment complexes across India can share this knowledge so easily. That's what I wanted to say. So thanks, Dr. Arvind, Dr. Gaud, uh, Poonam, Amar Karnika for such great coordination. And all of you participants for all the insightful questions that you've asked and the inputs you've given. As Amar said, you will hear from us. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye bye. Amar, I'm leaving. Yes, yes, doctor. Okay, Thank okay. You. Right. So, can we leave? Thank you yes. so much. Thank yes, you. yes, yes. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Omar.
Thank you. Thank you, Ashika. Thank you. Thank you, Amar. Thank you. Thank you so much.